Now we're rolling Damage Plan MMA podcast presented by Fierce Fighting Championship 25. On today's show, we've got Maddie Meacham, one half of our first pro fight of the evening on April 21st at the Maverick Center. Now, if you want to watch Maddie, as well as four championship belts be crowned on one of the most stacked cards in Fierce history, head over to FierceFightingChampionship.com. And if you're unable to attend, the pay-per-view is always available at that website. That's enough from me. Let's kick it over to Maddie Meacham. And right now we are joined by none other than Maddie Meacham, who is going to be making her third professional walk in just a couple of weeks at the Maverick Center. Maddie, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you, Blake. Thanks for having me on. Well, we're super excited to talk to you. I mean, you're headed into your third fight and just kind of wanted to talk to you. This is the quickest turnaround of your entire career so far, including your amateur run back in 2018. And so what has it been like kind of getting back in kind of faster than you have in the past? Yeah, so... Previously, we'd kind of planned back in 2019 to take more fights, obviously. But then when I broke my jaw, that um, those plans kind of changed and I wanted to make sure that I was fully healed. Then I kind of went into um, 2020, you know, I don't know how to explain there, but then having my son and coming back from that, I felt like I had a really basically a long fight camp because of getting back into it and working back the skills that I had, I continued to train, but while I was pregnant, I wasn't able to. And so just getting back, sharpening those skills, I felt like I had had a really long fight camp, basically, from the time that I got back to the time that I fought again. Um, and so it was kind of cool being able to jump in and take what I had learned, not only physically, but also, ment- also mentally, and kind of go that route and And so I was kind of ready to just jump back in and kind of take it by the horns. So I didn't actually know that you had broken your jaw. Could you kind of break down what happened there and how that all came to be and what that recovery was like? Because that's a, that's a big injury. Yeah. So I, back in 2019, I fought on LFA and we were out in Colorado and it was in the second round, I think. And I caught just a hook and um my mouth went numb I couldn't tell if I had bit my tongue I couldn't tell if I had teeth falling out and you can kind of see back in the video I I'm going like this and like trying to mentally check in with myself saying hey are we good <laughs> and so um I stopped the fight verbally because I didn't know I couldn't feel anything and so I didn't know how hurt I was and if I was going to do serious damage um, continuing. And so then had surgery, came back from that. It was a great surgery, an awesome surgeon. And, um, I wanted to go back into LFA in September, but there was some other things that in my life that I was working through. And so I took an extra long recovery for that, but then COVID happened. And so now we're here four years later. I'm always interested when people talk about injuries like that. I mean, one of the most vital things in our entire lives is just eating and drinking. What was that like for you when you had a broken jaw? Like how was, how were you getting nutrition and and nutrients just into your body? Yeah. So I couldn't, my surgeon wouldn't wire my jaw shut because I am really light for how tall I am. And so he, and especially after that, because for the few days after my fight, I wasn't able to eat very much. And so he said he wasn't going to wire it shut. He did something. He adjusted the surgery, um, for me instead. And so then I was able to just keeping up on calories <laughs> and just keeping up with that. And so, but it was an adjustment for sure. Typically a lot of fighters say that the adrenaline is so high that you don't feel any injury until you are, you know, walking yeah. out and getting checked by the doctor. The fact that you felt it in there has to go, just goes to show, I mean, how, serious the injury was had you ever had any situation like that in your amateur career where you're like oh my gosh I broke a hand oh my gosh I broke you know my thumb or something like that no so I had never had stitches I had never broken any bones in my entire life not only fighting but that was the first time that I had ever broken anything or had any stitches we'll kind of get off the injury train a little bit that's probably some of the darker times of your career but let's talk a little bit about about this last fight. I mean, you looked so good in there, you know, up until those finishing exchanges, but you in a lot of people's minds were winning that round and winning that fight up to that point. How did you feel in there after some time away? 
I felt awesome. It was so good to be back. I felt like the LFA fight back in 2019 was such a great experience, but I felt like because I had flown out somewhere, because I had, I didn't know what I was getting into. It was new. I didn't really understand how to control my adrenaline as much in a new situation. I felt like I was more, I wasn't controlling my adrenaline as, as well as I was before. And so that was my big thing about this first fight back was I want to be in control of my emotions, be in control of my adrenaline. And not that I had an adrenaline dump there in the cage, but the beforehand was awful. I usually I'm bouncing around. I'm excited. I'm ready to go. I'm enjoying this sport. This is what I love to do. And I didn't feel that when I was in Colorado because I was so focused on, I've got this, I've got this and not enjoying myself in the moment. And so this fight, I, I really wanted to just love being in there, love walking out. I wanted to love all of the parts of it that I was anxious for the last time. And so I was so excited to be out there. I was so excited to be in the cage. And obviously there's choices that I would make differently now, but that's part of it. And I was so excited to just be there and have a good opponent that would challenge me and, and that I could show what I have accomplished in these last few years. I've got to say, I mean, you, the, the cut that you landed on Amanda, um, on Amanda's head was, was very, very, I mean, gory. I'll just be completely honest with you. When you landed that, did you realize, was it not until after the fight that you realized like, oh my gosh, she is, you know, she has this huge cut on her head and there was a ton of blood coming out. Did that make it difficult at all? Was it more slippery? What was it like in there? Yeah. So it was like dish soap, <laughs> like wrestling and dish soap. <laughs> That's the best because it's a different consistency. And so I recognized that, but in the cage, it felt like I'd hit her like 15 or 16 different times, which looking back, it wasn't that many throwing those elbows. And it felt like I'd hit her so many times. I thought, okay, the ref's not going to stop it. The ref's not going to stop it. I got to go move to something else. Cause in that moment you're not counting. Oh, one, two, right. <laughs> you're just hitting and, and making instant decisions. Yeah. So you said that you love to do this and like, not everyone always wants to sign up to go get punched in the face or punch someone in the face for you. Where did that passion come from? How did this all come to be? So I kind of have a, a different backstory as to getting into it. Um, I served a mission for the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and before then I had done some self-defense classes and things like that. And I enjoyed those and I liked knowing how to defend myself. And so after my mission, I had decided that I wanted to get into not necessarily sport, but just do physical activity that I loved and enjoyed because I wasn't able to do it as much on my mission. And so I, my brother happened to uh, be doing jujitsu who was 12 at the time and he hated it. <laughs> and so he quit, but we'd already paid for like a year and a half of training. And so, um, I've known Aldo, my coach for a long time because my dad has been friends with him for a long time, um, years before I even started. And so I went and started doing the kickboxing classes and three days in, I realized that I really liked it and that I, it was something I could see myself doing. What was that like? How does your family now kind of think about your decision to do that? Because my mom, when I'm commentating these fights, my mom tells me, she's like, if you ever do this, I'm disowning you. Like, like you're done. Like, I can't, I can't be around this. I can't see this happen. How does your family kind of react to you doing something like this? It's interesting because a lot, I've heard of a lot of families reacting that way, but my, my mom and my dad are really supportive of me. They, um, they used to come to the fights. It stresses them out now <laughs> to come. They like to watch after and they'll watch, my mom will rewatch and rewatch all of the footage, but it's really anxiety. Um, it gives her a lot of anxiety to <laughs> watch them and she doesn't know how it's going to happen, but they are very, very supportive and, and it's really cool to see um, 
a lot of my extended family even will come in and shout and have a good time. When it comes to this upcoming fight, what are you looking forward to? What are some things that you've been working on? And, and what's kind of the reason that, that you wanted to get back in so quickly? So I really wanted to jump in because I felt like I had trained so hard for so long without taking a fight that I felt like I had, again, done a giant fight camp and that I was really at the top of what I could be and still growing, obviously, there's no cap, but that I felt like my cardio is where I wanted it to be. My, my mindset's where it's at. Um, and just kind of where we are in, in a stage of our lives, I felt like I could take these fights back to back because I was in the mindset for it and, and ready to go. Um, some things that I've been working on um, is that not only obviously mental game, but also um, I feel like my jujitsu has been really great. I've done some tournaments, things like that. Um, and my stand up is really great. I felt like the in-between is where I struggled. And so this last fight camp, I really worked on the in-between, the between stand-up and, and groundwork. Talking a little bit about your career so far, a three and one amateur 2017 to 2018, that was a very, very productive time in your career. Are you trying to get back to that three fights a year, trying to get as many reps as you possibly can coming into this 2023? I would like to women's MMA and, and men's is a little bit different because the family dynamic is different. And so we have one son right now and we do want more kids in the future. And so it is kind of, okay, I'm, when I'm fighting, I'm all in, like, this is what I'm doing. I'm all in, but then I might have to take some time off to have another kid. And that could be years down the road. You know, that's not, <laughs> soon at all but that is something that I have to consider where the men don't if they're gonna have another kid their wife takes care of having the kid part you talked a lot about being all in and you talked a lot about how much this is kind of your entire life and you're locked into doing this what is your daily schedule like how often are you at one hit how often are you there how many reps are you getting in what is a typical week of training like for you my if I, if this was a perfect world and babysitters were absolutely perfect, I would love to be there, right? All the time. But the reality of it is, is that I also run a business and I'm a mom. And so usually my daily schedule, I'm up at five at Vasa, the local gym here, putting in the work between cardio and gaining muscle. And then, um, you know, fine tuning, strengthening my, my body so that I can endure the, the heat that it takes during the other times of the day. And then usually I'm either at work, so running a business or, and then at all those once or twice a day. I got to ask you outside of fighting, just curious, we don't really do this all that often, but I feel like we need to like get more into the mind and, and the life Outside of MMA, what are some things that you like to do? What are some things that you're interested in? Going into business, I help run a business um, for training dogs. And so I train dogs. And so it's really cool because I actually, that's helped me a lot with my fighting, which you wouldn't think it would, but it does because a lot of dog training is working with adrenaline and how they control that adrenaline. And a lot of the signs that they show when their adrenaline is getting higher, we, as well as humans do. And so it's been really cool seeing dogs be able to work through theirs and me thinking, oh, I'm feeling this way. It's not because I'm particularly, it doesn't matter if I'm nervous or excited, but getting up high like that and is not, it's going to create a dump. And so it, that kind of thing interests me and, and working with dogs and, and also raising my son, obviously. Did you have a dog growing up? Did you like, where does your love for dogs come from? We did have a dog growing up. He was one of a kind. Um, but I wish I could go back in, in time and, and train that dog. But I actually, it started in 2020 when I, we had 
my husband and I purchased a, a dog and he would not stop barking. <laughs> he could not stop. And um, I decided that if we were going to have kids, that if this dog woke up a child after I just put it down, I would go nuts. And so I actually went and I trained my dog and the owner of the business came to me after we finished our training and said, Hey, would you like to be a trainer? And so I quit my job. I, I was working at a bank at the time. I quit my job and I started doing that and haven't looked back. How empowering and how satisfying has it been to be able to kind of step away from your typical nine to five and jump into something that you're truly passionate about, build your own business and, and create something that you truly believe in. It's been, it has been a really unique experience. Um, my dad is also an entrepreneur. So I kind of grew up in that seeing what it takes. It's not just like a backpack that you put on the nine to five. Okay. You put the backpack on and at five o'clock, you take it off, you go home and, and everything's done. Right. But I watched my dad literally sometimes it was 11 o'clock at night. He's working and I try and not do that here. Right. It's, uh, but it's really cool to be passionate and, and not only in my home with, with my family, but at work and in training, I feel like it's really improved my training because I'm not emotionally drained and I haven't, I'm not mentally spent by the time I get to the gym. So, you know, in a weird interconnected mm -hmm. way, it seems like you following your passion has created less stress, more production, more productivity, as well as you being able to do fighting as well, which is probably, you know, what we're talking about right now, one of the biggest goals. So when you look back, how much does, do you feel like following passions? How much do you feel like doing things the way that you want to do them has kind of blessed your life in a way, I guess I should say. I think that there is a time and a place for enduring a crappy work situation, but I also believe that any situation that you're in, any trial, if that's what you want to call it, um, that you're in is also a blessing. So if you're in a crappy job, then, then it might be because you just need to hold out just long enough so that the timing's right to then follow your passion. And so, and I think it changes us. And so I think I spent a lot of time building that person up that I was, and, and now I'm kind of reaping the rewards of being able to follow my passion and in fighting in home and working with dogs and working, really it's working with people is what I enjoy doing because I'm teaching people. Well, Maddie, you do an incredible job in the cage. I'm sure your business is incredible as well. We really appreciate the time to chat with you a little bit. Thank you so much for the time. Thank you.